Homesteads and Homeschools as part of the Liberty Hippie Podcast Network. If you like what we do, be sure to check out This Week in Liber Pods, Peace Freaks, Cannabis Heals Me, and Free Markets Green Earth. We're living proof that libertarian doesn't mean washed up Republican. My guest today is uh, Mr. Dave Hunter out there in, uh, in Washington. And uh, he's on today to talk about bees. Um, but it's probably probably not quite what you're thinking. We'll, we'll get into it. But Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. I, I appreciate your time. Oh, that's awesome. I'm so glad to be here. So before we really get into, well, let's get into the bees a little bit, I guess. Um, have you always done bees? Uh, no, Ben. I... Um... I was in real estate and did a whole bunch of different things. And uh, years ago, gosh, maybe 20 some years ago, uh, my wife came home from a class she was in and she said, these guys have just hundreds of apples on their tree. And we had like three. <laughs> I said, well, you know, go find out what they're doing. And she came back and she said, ah, they have mason bees. So what's that? And well, all right. So I went on, I just drilled some holes in a block of wood. And uh, the following year, we had uh, little visitors using these little holes. It's like, huh. And a couple of years later, all of a sudden, we had hundreds of apples. It's like, okay. And then you kind of fast forward, and that just became a hobby. And then, oh, my company, is, it was a big international freight company, uh, closed its doors. And I was able to, um, uh, so bequeathed with time off, I dug into this industry and of, of mason bees and just found that there was no um no pattern uh, these bees were amazing but no one was using them uh, the mm -hmm. scientists had shown all these cool things but there wasn't an industry so you know yeah. i created an industry and and then got a company going and um yeah. love what i'm doing <laughs> that's awesome so do you you just skip honeybees all together then i feel like it's a yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah in loving words um this is, okay i'm i i think the honeybee is at least one of the most sophisticated insects out there okay so i'm not going to disrespect <laughs> that okay so loving words um the scientists call them pollen pigs you um when you look at the pictures of these bees carrying their pollen sticky on the hind legs these guys, they're, they're so cool. They mm -hmm. need a, a thousand eggs are laid a day and a thousand mounds of pollen are needed each day. Okay? And so you think about that. So they, they have this waggle dance where they angle over the dance, the length of the dance says, hey, go find pollen there. And so bees will go out to there and take all the pollen back to the hive. Mm -hmm. And so they're stripping the pollen. Oh, I'm not loving words. They're Stripping's a good word. Um, and so the, the bees, the native bees out there, um, are so less organized. They're belly flopping in the flower, and, and the pollen is all dry in their abdomen. And the next flower they go to, the dry pollen's falling off. And so there's pollen spreaders. And, and um, what I've learned, Ben, in, in uh, you know, nice words, is that my company... It says crown bees. All right. My company is a food company masquerading as a bee company. When mm -hmm. you use the right bee on the right crop, more food is produced because that cross pollination is happening right. always. So, yeah, you know, word to, to respond. <laughs> Long story <laughs> short, the honeybee is, is best handled by other people, and I'm focusing on the whole nesting. Bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did, I um, I think when everybody thinks of bees or or you think about pollination, that's like the go to, right? Is is oh, yeah. honeybees, and I just think it's an interesting kind of step to go to just bypass them all together and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to do these guys instead. Was that like something that you thought about as you did it, or was it just like how did you figure out that? Well, I can put some holes in a block over here, and maybe well, that'll attract these little no, bees. Dude. Ben, that's how it started, okay? I mean, just, I want more apples. You know? And right. then and then you kind of fast forward. It's like, well, what's going on between the holes? And then you start realizing, oh, there's a cocoon in there. And how do you get, what happens with that cocoon? And it wasn't until when I, you know, bequeathed with Tom Asimov there, 
I had six months of severance and, and I spent six weeks interviewing every possible researcher in the world and all the practitioners. And you just say, well, gosh, if, if you can get triple the cherries, hmm. well, how come no one's doing this? And I, and actually the scientist, oh, he's retired now, he said, Dave, go watch the movie Bottle Shock. Well, what's that? So I went out, checked it out, you know, back then with a the VHS. And um, it was the uh, California wine industry trying to get into the their better than the French wine industry. And so I called the scientist back. I said, all right, honeybees are to French wine as mason bees are to California wine. He goes, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. So then, you know, still how come no one's using it? He goes, Dave, farmers change at the pace of a glacier. Yeah. They do what their dads taught them. And they only use honeybees and you can't change it today, but like like California wine, it just slowly spreads that there's something else out there. Yeah. That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought, I, I don't think I've heard that before when we get the, the pace of a glacier, but it's it's true. Um, you, know, you think think about all the different ways of farming that are happening and different styles that are out there and, and how many people still use, you know, what, what we've used for the last hundred years and doesn't doesn't quite work for everybody but well, yeah and, and at that end i mean to me i as i watch there's a lot of mess going on and mm -hmm. there's a lot of people selling things that they want their company to survive and so they're going to tell you that chemicals are important they're going to tell you that tilling's important and and i think um what i'm learning there's um, a whole different track here ben is um i'm very concerned about the soil of the world that we're just mm -hmm. not regenerating the soil and I think there's some practices that need to be um, learned quickly to yeah. preserve that and you know good soil then has good plants and good plants then need bees and, you know, so I'm yeah. I'm a few steps down from good soil but and it's all it's all connected you can't you know can't have one without the other I'll intertwine oh, there no dude I promise you if I put my bees out there and you're in your desert <laughs> they're gonna fly a long ways <laughs> yeah yeah but, so um on the bees, then, um, what, what when you say mason bee, um, what do you mean? Like, what what is a mason bee for somebody that's uh, you know, there's okay, okay. there's honey bees and there's wasps and okay. you know, yeah, that's funny. Bees. Okay, so there's there's actually five bees in the world. Okay, I was doing, okay. First one, there, there's honey bees. Everyone knows that. Okay, and then everyone knows what a bumblebee is. And then they go, well, all hornets are obviously bees. All wasps are obviously bees. And then you raise the last little finger and everything else. Okay, right. so so. In truth, there's like 24,000 or more species of bees around the world. Okay, North America, there's about 4,000 of native bees. And surprisingly, okay, Ben, here's a, here's a quiz for you. <laughs> How many of those native bees make honey? I'm, I'm a G. Yeah, just, just that, I imagine just yeah, none, none of them, right? Not, none like, of them. <laughs> Ooh, you could read. Okay. <laughs> yeah, none of those. So, out of those, I don't know, 4,000 species, none make, none make honey. Um, and most of them are solitary bees. So I'm gonna, there's going to be two mm -hmm. little rules here. Solitary and social. So social is honeybee, bumblebee, where there's one queen and a whole bunch of workers that work for that one queen. Okay, so that's 10% of the bees. 90% of the bees, all the, every single female is a queen and she works by herself. She's solitary and she nests in the ground or nests in the holes and she does all of her, she gathers, she does all of her work. She gathers the pollen and the nectar, puts it someplace safe, lays an egg and then seals that little chamber. And the eggs that she's laid this year are next year's bees. Okay, so 90% of the bees are like that. Okay, now, um, so, oh, and, and Part two, most of the bees nest in the ground. So about three quarters of the bees, ground bees, nest, other, um, others, minor bees, digger bees, alkali bees, all these bees are all nesting in the ground. Okay, so about a quarter, 20, 25% nest in um, holes. So like a reed or a hole in a tree. They are, um, they're opportunists. 
and there's small little bees and there's medium sized and large and they all just nest in holes so the as I'm a food company so we're, we're trying to you know get bees to the right place I can't take a shovel full of dirt and hope that I have any bees in there and move from my yard to your yard without crushing or but mm -hmm. I can take a tube of bees and hand them from me to you and now you've got bees in your yard mm -hmm. so we focus on the whole nesting bees okay so there's I'm in my last little part getting into when we say mason bees mm -hmm. I'm kind of saying cat or dog there's hundreds of species of whole nesting bees um, and so the ones that I can you know easily talk about uh, the blue orchard is a mud using bee and it's found in most every state and province kind of North America and that's real common and there's other bees that use um, right I'm going too far that was Mason <laughs> we'll get into how they work okay so Mason bees and then there's also leaf cutter bees and there's cuckoo bees and all the different things that nest in holes yeah it's a uh, it's interesting because you, you don't you don't think about that when you think about like you see those little bees flying around you don't think that they're it, it's that intricate or or to take the time and actually think about where where does that bee going where's his home you know oh. where's her home yeah yeah so true and, and you know they're they're um they're in your ground around you so if mm -hmm. you if you you'll see um bare spots of dirt you'll see uh, if there's one hole and a lot of bees are coming out of one hole in the ground that's a social bee and you're probably going to get stung mm -hmm. okay <laughs> so so okay if, if you see a bunch of tiny little holes and one bee going in and out of their own little hole well those are solitary and, and the reason one you get stung one you don't get stung um, a social bee they're protecting the queen they're protecting all of the eggs that are inside there so get close you're gonna get stung so you'll find this with hornets and wasps etc right okay well if the solitary bee each female she has a choice she can sit there and defend her hole or and starve you know or she's going to go out and gather pollen and nectar and lay her eggs and, and she's doing everything They're, they just aren't designed to sting unless right. squish one on your hand or you know <laughs> i've been there okay and it just they still sting and they say hey don't kill me yeah. and the, and it, it hurts real briefly and then it, you can't really see where they stung you so yeah. the solitary 90 percent of these bees are gentle you know calm little bees yeah yeah um they are I, and I, I i can attest to that we, we get them in the inside of our screen and porch sometimes and you know you get them on you trying to get them out the door and one of them will zap you a little bit and it's there and gone but, so what what do you guys uh your your company then um what kind of bees do you have how many how many different spe uh, species i guess yeah that's uh, right that's right uh, that's the right word um well, that's a very astute question. Um, as we started off, I had only the one mason bee is this blue orchard that uses okay. um, moist clay. And it's found everywhere. And as I started, uh, that's all I was focusing on because the almond industry down in California needed hundreds and thousands and millions of these bees and there weren't enough. So that's where I was going to make all of my money. Mm -hmm. And then um, I started working with researchers. And I'm on a once a month phone call with some uh, really cool researchers around the world focusing on these solitary bees and and they were only you know they were only talking about three species one for Europe one for Asia one for the US I said do you guys know why you're only talking about three bees someone said humorous Dave what's going on why <laughs> I said well because that's all you have in your hands I said if there's a thousand whole nesting species of bees across the country and if I gave you some, would you guys start, you know, realizing what goes on with those? Yeah, I guess we would. And so there's bees now, like in the Northeast, there's Osmia pumila, goes in a small eighth inch hole, amazing spring pollinator. There's Osmia, I don't know, all these different species <laughs> that use mud or resin or leaf bits or, or chewed up leaf bits. And they nest in holes. And they're, you know, they're there everywhere. And it's just the, um, uh, we're learning. We, the public, are learning mm -hmm. that there's more to life than just the honeybee. Yeah. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely ours. I've seen seen mason bees popping up more and more. People talking about them and people utilizing them, and you know, different different ways there. Um, so, do you guys have uh, the leaf cutter bees as well? Okay, so yeah, I, you asked the question, I dogged it. Um, oh, yeah. so, okay, so so, <laughs> so we went past that, and then um, back in 1984, uh, the Japanese mason bee was given to the U.S. half a million cocoons. It's a brown mason bee that uses mud. And poof, that was kind of shotgunned across the U.S. In 1985, the U.S. said, uh, here's the Invasive Species Act. You can't do mm -hmm. what we just did. <laughs> okay, so now those two are, so there's, we have uh, the horn face Japanese bee. Cool, little bee, same thing, uh, uses mud. And then, um, oh, I don't know, five or six years ago, a friend of mine was in, He's in the alfalfa leaf cutter bee industry, and and you say, well, is that bee only useful on alfalfa? He says, well, no, it's a generalist. I said, so can you use it on something not alfalfa? He goes, well, no one does that, Dave. <laughs> oh, okay, could I try it in my yard? And all of a sudden, I had more beans and more peas. And it's like, well, okay. So then, where I'm a teammate, mine is down in Nashville. So we put these. Um, alfalfa you know it's no longer alfalfa now it's just a leaf cutter bee on um on, on their crops organic fields and they complained too much too much food they put it on like um <laughs> acorn squash and acorn squash is supposed to be i don't know size x and it was, yeah. there was so much on their field they couldn't pick them and it got to be too big and they just left there rotted and and <laughs> another farm said oh my gosh we have like three rows of beans so by the time you get back to the third row all the beans are dried on the vines we couldn't pick the beans faster. Yeah. Like, That's wild. Okay, so we, so we have three bees. And I'm, I have, you know, next, this is 2020, you and I are talking. By 21, I think we're going to have a bee from the southwest. It's a, you know, a California, Arizona bee. And it's just, um, as we're getting bigger, we're able to start um, finding the bees of North America and trying to learn how to raise them with enough, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, raise them so that uh, we can uh, get the bees of Oklahoma pollinating crops in Oklahoma. Right. Yeah. You know, right now we're not. Yeah. How how regional are they? Um, you know, if... there there's a um, there's a big word called um, eco region. Don't know if you know that, but it's. Um, in the state of Washington, we have uh, five or six eco regions. The east of the Cascades is hot. Mm -hmm. West of the Cascades is is cooler. Down by the Puget Sound, it's it's more temperate and up in the Olympic. So we have these different places where uh, the ponderosa pine only grows on the east side of the state. The Douglas fir on the left side of the state. So same thing with bees. You have um, climates that these bees prefer, and I'm going to say across the country. Maybe there's 38 or 40 different kind of climates, and each one has bees that flow in that region, and okay. it's kind of more temperature based, I think. Then, right, yeah. So if I wanted to to get myself some of them, um, there's something something on the website or some way I could contact somebody to to figure that out, so I don't, you know, buy a bee that wants it cold and I'm putting it out in 100 degrees. Oh yeah, yeah. We try it. Yeah. Oh, oh, dude. Yeah, we know that. We, yes, we. And it's so hard. We're trying to give instruct. We have bees now. Um, people, people in Pennsylvania raise bees, and they have too many. We've taught them how to do it. They raise too many, and then they send them to us in the mail. So I have cocoons that I'm holding in my hands in the mail, and then we clean them and put them in our coolers over here that says Pennsylvania on them. And in the springtime, okay. we're sending these bees back to Pennsylvania and maybe New Jersey so that those bees that are from that area stay in that area so it's right. kind of our um that's cool i, I like that it's uh, i think to when you're saving seeds and collecting seeds and, and where you get your seeds from and, and so much matters you know if i can get the same squash seeds from my neighbor down the road or somebody up in you know new york it's going to be they can grow totally differently and I, I like that that's really a unique kind of way to do things. So if I have too many bees, I can send them back or is there like a special sort of way to do that with, with you or how does yeah, that work? Yeah, yeah, just... actually, yeah. so it's called um, bee buyback and just in the, um, in the fall, you know, we, we have a, uh, let me back out. 
we have a thing called B-mail. Once a month we say, hey, do this, whether it's for the Mason, the Liquor, it's June, do this, it's August, do that, okay? Um, and in the fall we say, hey everybody, you're supposed to um, open your nesting holes up and separate the good guys from the bad guys. And there's, in, in the bug, eat bug world, mm -hmm. there's, um, I like the bees, I don't like the pollen mites, so in my world, I get rid of those. Okay? Right. So, in, 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 hey, so harvest your cocoons, you hold them in your hands, mail them to us. It's called bee buyback, and we, we from our website, we give you um, gift certificates from our website. So it's, it's um, we are getting more and more people raising solitary bees, and we're able to, you know, get more and more places in the country covered. So, awesome. Yeah, so we think about it. Good deal. I like that. Um, so with leaf cutters, leaf cutter yeah. bees, um, is that going to hurt my plants? I mean, how much? Yeah, know? exactly. It's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, let, let, wait, let's back out. So we'll get there. Okay. We're going to get it. But, so what's going on in these holes? Okay. So you got like a six inch little uh, straw or a, a reed. Okay. Um, what's going on? And so, um, a bee, a female bee. So she's come out and she's, you know, she checks the area out. Ah, look, is there pollen around here? Yeah. Is there holes of the right size? Yeah. And then I'm a bee that uses clay. So can I find some moist clay around here? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Those three things. I'm going to choose my own hole and that's mine. And so she starts using that hole and she goes back to the end of that hole and she starts gathering pollen and a little bit of nectar and just about a pea-sized bit of pollen, maybe it's 30 trips of pollen gathering, scrapes it off. She lays an egg, and then she, she seals that little chamber. Okay, so she's, I don't know, 20 trips worth of mud gathering, has a little pollen egg mud chamber. And then she works through that whole tube, and maybe this blue orchard that we use, it's a little larger bee, maybe six little eggs are laid in one hole. So maybe in her life, she does two holes, and then she's dead. She, she's dead, and those eggs are next year's bees, and they metamorphose this summer, and they spin their own little cocoons, and then they are adult bees in the fall, and in the winter they just um, hibernate, and in the springtime, out they come out of their cocoons, and the whole life cycle starts. The boys mate with the girls, and they're dead after a couple of weeks, and then you know <laughs> eggs, eggs are laid. Right. So that's that's mason bee that she uses mud, and there are bees that. Um, don't have mud around them and they use uh, resin from trees. Okay, so pollen egg resin. Or there are bugs that use bees that use um, uh, cactus pulp. Yeah. Okay, so wherever you're at, these bees have adapted. So the leaf cutter bee, she's learned to use um, uh, leaves like a hosta or a strawberry leaf and they, they cut a little circle out of the port of the part of the leaf, cup that in their little, in their little legs and they fly back to that hole stuff it in there, kind of, you know, glue it with her saliva, and then a bunch of little leaves, and then there she's now laying pollen in this little cavity, and then lays her egg, and then seals it. So she's used leaf bits to protect her egg. It was like, and so I've got, now, okay, dude, I'm the owner, okay? I have a lot of these leftover bees, and I put them in my yard out here in the Northwest. Okay, and I have these bees flying into these holes with leaf bits, and I can't, for the life of me, find what they're, I, I, they must be getting it from my neighbor's yard. Okay? <laughs> there's no holes in my yard. So yeah, yeah. Like, well, I don't know where they're getting it from. You know, I, I, like I said, two years ago, I saw a leaf cutting bee use it from a hosta. I have a hosta. So I found one hole from thousands of bees. Okay. Yeah. I don't think so. You were saying, is it going to yeah, ruin my, yeah. you know, and they're really in your yard. I think the le you know, leaves are there to, you know, for caterpillars to eat. I mean, you know, right. hey, you know, yeah, yeah. I think you know, I, I, that's kind of what I would imagine, right? You got so many leaves out there and lots to choose from. But. Okay, now, if you have just one plant, it's the only plant your whole yard is full of nothing. Okay, <laughs> yeah, well, I bet that one plant's going to get decimated. Okay, but you know, really, it's like mm, mm, I, yeah. no one's, no one's ever, honestly, no one has ever complained. But that question is always there, Ben. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, you know. Um, all right, so if, is there anything I can do to attract them naturally? I know you said in the beginning you went out and, and drilled holes and, 
he mentioned an eighth, eighth of an inch holes here and there, but he's mm -hmm. like, or so there's, um, so the, the mystique right now, so everyone talking about Mason bees and they're all drilling five sixteenth inch or, or eight millimeter holes. That's all they're drilling. And, you know, there are small, medium and, and large bees. So if you were to go build it and they come, these bees are looking for, you know, so I would do a, I would do a bunch of holes that you could ultimately open up. So reeds, uh, drilled blocks of wood, um, just small, small little discussion. And, and there's a lot of um, bamboo products that you can find in some big box stores out there. Bamboo is a, um, a hole nesting hole that can't be opened up safely okay so what happens with these things is that you uh, you, you put them out your bees will use them and, and as they're using them they're also bringing in pests there's pollen mites that stick in the pollen there's parasitic wasps that want to go in all oh, there's there's a Houdini fly came from Europe three, three or so years ago and all these things go in with the pollen and eat either the pollen or eat the bees, one of the two, okay? So no big deal. You, you put your holes out, drill blocks of wood, and and eggs were laid and pests are in there, et cetera. So that's fine. So now next year, well, the bees have survived. They're going to come out through this mass of pests and begin to use those holes again. Hey, look, here's available holes. And they're bees. You know, no one tells them to do something different. Um, you've got these pests in there now with open arms saying, hey, feed me. So in that second year hole, most of the eggs, and most of the pollen goes to the pests. Mm. And so um, we're, you know, as I said, I'm a food company masquerading as a bee company. I'm always trying to get more food, and so I need more bees. And so we've learned to open holes up. So bamboo is something we try to avoid. Drill blocks of wood, eh, try to avoid that. Um, you could do drilled blocks of wood and line each little hole with parchment paper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the fall, you can pull the parchment paper out and in your little hands, you have good guys and bad guys. Or with our, we have wood trays, we have reeds that can crack open, we have paper mm -hmm. tubes that can unwind. So um, back to uh, build it and they come. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of little holes in your yard and, you know, put them in the sunny spot, put them in a shady spot and see what happens. Um, the bees used to be there across the nation, okay? Yeah. And then we kind of move in with our big, you know, kill all the trees and plant all of our crops. All right. And there's a little less bees out there and then you... You um, smear housing and asphalt roads and, you know, lawns and beauty bark and, oh, crud. Well, where's all my, you know, where's the space for my hole nesting or the ground nesting? Yeah. Nesting one? It's like, ah, crap. So, you know, and then we go out and we put lawn treatment. Oh, I've got to have artificially green lawn. <laughs> and, and, oh, my gosh, I got an aphid, which is food for a ladybug. Oh, my gosh, there's an aphid. Bring out my kill them. Yeah. And we kill everything in my yard, and then we say, "Well, where are my bees?" Yeah, you know, I've got tomatoes. Where's my bees? Well, hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, okay, yeah. the bees that used to be there, or were we even there last? You know, last year. It just, it's, it's hard uh, being a bee in today's world with human encroachment and chemicals, and and so building they come is my want. Yeah. I would never buy any of my bees. I want people everywhere finding the bees of their area, teaming with my company to just, ah, what nested there? And then let's raise a lot of them, and then we can put them back where they belong. But right now, there's a lot of bees uh, missing. Yeah, I imagine. Yeah. It's, it's been how we've been, ah, oh, man, just spraying and, and dumping everything on, well, on I, the ground. I, for I don't want ticks in my yard oh, okay yeah. i don't want dragonfly larvae in my lawn i don't want the zika or you know yeah. so i'm killing <laughs> so what what people don't understand they're yeah. spraying for zika in the southeast and wherever and they do this aerial spraying every flying insect yeah. 
is dead. And you read the papers, oh my gosh, Mrs. Smith's honeybee hives, you know, yeah. or her. Every native bee that was flying then is dead. And we don't yeah. think of the damage we're doing because we don't want someone, you know, I don't know, I don't want anyone to get, you know, Zika disease. Yeah. Right. I get that. And I don't want to have a Lyme disease tick on me. I, I get that, but it's like, oh, yeah. guys, we're just... Yeah. There's a trade-off there, you know. I mean, you, what yeah. do you do for for pollinators? You know, what's what's uh, well your your food food sources are uh, you know yeah, and the people that yeah. the people that make the chemicals that kill the the you know whatever mm -hmm. they have a, they want to make a living, and you know they're all nice people, and you know they believe with what they're doing. I think <laughs> I'm just a naturalist, and I don't you know I, it's a tough one. I don't want to have a tick on me. Yeah, you know. But, comma, I do want to have pollinated tomatoes. Yep. No, I, I hear you. And uh, we, uh, when I was in New York, we had deer ticks out the wazoo. I mean, that was, you couldn't go out. I used to run and you'd go for a run. I'd just have them all over the place. Um, down here, we have the, the Lone Star ticks. It's not really Lyme disease, it's something else. Um, and I, but, you know, you can take precautions. You know, I can put a little bit of like bug spray on my shoe or something that just keeps them from like climbing up. And it's a lot less, you know, of an impact than oh, yeah. dousing everything. But yeah. And people have said, you know, go put diametrous, diatometrous earth out there. Mm -hmm. So white talcum powder, just boom, spray in your yard. Okay. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's not toxic chemicals. How this stuff works though. If you are, right. um, uh, a hard shell insect like an ant or a bee or a ladybug, this powder gets into your joints and freezes the joints and then just gets stuck frozen like the old, you know, like the Tin Woodman. <laughs> yeah, and, and you just die because you're just, your legs are yeah. frozen. It's like, oh. Yeah. You know, and there's even, actually, there's, there's a researcher uh, in Montana State, just came out a couple of days ago. This is, you and I are talking in, in June of 2020. Um, He's trying to say, you know, everyone focuses on this neonicotinoids that's uh, impacting the honeybees. Well, what happens with all this chemical crud that's getting stuck into the ground and you've got 90% of the bees or 75% of the bees are nesting in the ground? What's happening with them? So he's actually right now just looking for, you know, starting his research on are we killing the ground nesting bees with all of this stuff? I, yeah. I hope he's, you know, I hope he's successful and find that out. Uh, I, you gotta assume he's on the right path. I, I can't imagine you escape that without. You well, know. well, and, you know, and off, you know, the off the beaten track of our of our blog here is, you know, do. <laughs> I want food. Yeah, it, it's a it's a dilemma I don't have, or you know, I don't I don't know the answer to is I want food, and I think um, monoculture, where yeah. you have one crop is probably not natural. And when you have yeah. one big thousand acre or you know 10 acre something, the pest that moves in says, oh my gosh, look how much food there is. They just keep on going and going and going. And the polyculture way, when you have lots of crops, what scientists are, are now, or researchers are now seeing, that if you let an organic crop, um, let all of the pests stay alone and you have, um, uh, the more the more bugs that build up, bugs are eating bugs, which are eating bugs, and they say that when you have just a, you know a cacophony of insects on your farm, there's few pests that actually damage your crop yeah. because all the bugs are getting eaten. And if you just let bugs, if you let the bug kingdom go, you probably yeah. have more food. Yeah, I, I believe they kind of takes care of itself you know and at the same time your, your plants are going to be healthier and they can deal with losing a leaf here a little bit there to a pest that, that yeah. does eat it you know yeah, and um, i don't want to have a bug in my apple you know yeah. Yeah, okay <laughs> it's just protein then <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah and your listeners are all cringing <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure many of them know uh, <laughs> you can't uh I mean, you just take you know any any year yeah anyway but yeah. Hey, you leave leave you know your tomatoes out on the the counter for a day you see all the little oh, yeah. fruit flies that just where did they come from maybe uh, maybe out of the skin i don't know yeah, but yeah. uh so so the bees that we're trying to focus on um these are whole nesting bees and 
And actually, so the you know to do this is is simple. Your it takes maybe forty five minutes a year to manage these bees. So whether you you buy bees from us, and, you know we'll mail them to you. You're going to spend fifteen minutes just thinking where where am I going to put my bee house? So there's fifteen minutes, okay? <laughs> and you're going to put your bees and you know they they go in a little chamber or something like that. And you know, there's five minutes, okay. Now, watching these bees in action, that's five or six hours. You're just watching because it's yeah. so stinking cool. Okay, okay, but that doesn't count. So now in the fall, you're taking this thing off. It's five minutes walking into your house, you know, and to to harvest things, maybe 15 or 20 minutes just to, and we have videos that show you how to do all this. And then you're just going to store these bees in your fridge or in a, in a garage or something. So your cocoons over here. So that's about, you know, 45 minutes worth of, um, uh, yeah. learning about cool little bugs that you know that pollinate so yeah. super easy to do that's awesome it, it's it's um it's one of those things i think when, when people start to realize to get an idea of of the natural world around them and like what what lives in this environment that i live in and is useful and is helping me and it gives you the, there's more buy-in right people are more interested in in knowing those things, they have a better connection to, you know, their, their local environment and they're less likely to, you know, throw the can out the window or spray their lawn with whatever they're spraying to make it, you know, weed more attractive. Or, yeah, yeah. And that's, you know, so one of the things I, I did to myself, I'm going to say five years ago, I, I forced myself to sit by, I don't know what it was, it was flowering, some bush in my yard. Mm -hmm. and just counts you can count the species of bees that were and massed on this thing and i got to maybe like 11 and there's a big bumblebee with the orange stripe different than a bumblebee was the yellow stripe okay mm -hmm. and tiny ass little somethings and medium somethings and it was like yeah. and, and honeybees you know it's like oh it's just okay. not a honeybee there's just and you know to spend 15 minutes staring at a bush is um is it get to do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's well worth it. I mean, like just I remember you know before I had kids running around all the time, just being able to like sit outside and just listen and see and look and and just take it all in. And it's I don't know. It, it's amazing what is out there that you know we don't see or think of on a on a day to day basis. But. Yeah, there was um there was an experiment a little bit ago. Like I took a um he had a cubic um foot of wire so wires foot by foot by foot okay and he um i think he videoed it and he put it on the ground and he just counted everything that walked or flew through it and you have the um, the mass of you know so a natural place might have i don't know 500 things crawled or fly you know flew through it mm -hmm. and he, the quantities of species and everything and then he took that same cube and moved it around in different environments and funny like on a corn cornfield out there in the middle of you know right. iowa or whatever was nuked completely yeah one thing went through a small little spider. <laughs> it's like, hey, hey. Yeah. 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 He, put it, he put it in the jungle and birds will fly. It was just, it was a cool experiment of, um, okay. That's crazy. Well, it just, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of bugs in the world. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I have a healthy appreciation for that statement. And then I only can focus on one thing. You know, so yeah. I'm just focusing on the whole nesting bees. And if we can get big enough and we can get advanced enough, can I find, I don't know, a, a bee for every ecoregion that we can get raised in, in mass and have the bees of North Dakota found that some, okay, ah, different statement. Um, <laughs> in the life cycle of these things, so pollen shows up in your backyard from early spring and there's even pollen deep into maybe August, September. Okay. All the bees live six weeks. Okay. So these little whole nesting bees, they, the were eggs last year. They're now bees this year. They go out and they do their thing and they're dead. So they've laid their yeah. eggs. And so some bees show up in early March. Some bees show up in May, some bees are in July, some bees are in September. And, and this, um, they've adapted because there's always pollen out there at that same time. So it's not only the right size hole that is there, 
but it's having holes out your entire season. Gotcha. So, okay, the other th the other part that shows up too. So um, there are other bugs that use the holes too. So you're going to find wasps will use the solitary wasps. They're going to go grab prey from your yard. Uh, crickets, some species, or wormy things, other species that inchworm them. Stuff them into the hole, parasitize them, lays an egg, seals yeah. that little chamber with mud or grass blades or something, and um, they'll use those holes too. So not only do you have a bee hotel in your yard, you've got well, a hotel that has, um, you're, a, you're a diverse, yeah. yeah, you allow all sorts of insects in your hotel. That's awesome. It really, really sounds like it really increases the, the biodiversity much more than just a, a beehive stacked on top of another hive. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. Loving words. And again, I'm not, you know, I know enough about the honeybee, um, but there's it's one of those things also that um, research is showing that um, when you put the honeybee out there, because it's so um, good at taking the pollen back from its Radius, they're finding um, it's actually harming the native bees because there's mm -hmm. not enough pollen for them to use. In fact, uh, UC San Diego a year ago went out and studied the, the you know San Diego area. Oh my gosh, they said because you have all these people raising all these honeybees everywhere, the plant, the native plants in those areas, uh, the pollen's not being cross, it's not being carried anymore. It's all going back to the hive. So they're seeing the the plants are having to evolve to try to become self fertile, and mm -hmm. they're failing. That's and crazy. the native bees are missing. So they're saying, ah, you guys, if you have honeybees, try to keep them about a mile a hive, hmm. a mile apart, so that because wow. you know, these hives have a five acre radius, and so if we can kind of keep the you know hive that far apart, then we might maybe get some of the native flora back. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so I didn't, I'm not saying they're bad guys, but you know, and who doesn't like honey? Right. Like, uh, everything in moderation, I guess. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I, 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 um, I tried bees, honeybees one time and, uh, I think I chased them off cause I was too, too curious, kept opening them up and looking at them. <laughs> what a cool thing. But, yeah. Uh, I know. Right. Yeah. But, uh, and that's, that's what it is. And I think the, um, when you have monoculture, we said this, um, too many things in one space, you know, has pests uh, walk on through them. With the honeybee, I believe there's like 90 some maladies, whether it's a virus or a fungus or, or mites or all, all these bark beetles, there's mm -hmm. 90 something. And you're saying, wow, uh, that's a lot of things going wrong all at once. I wonder if humans are mess, messing this up. And you go out and you look at the um, you look at the the almond industry, the dirtiest pollination, and they say nowadays because mm -hmm. there's so much disease being passed in there. When you put two hives per acre, and you realize that these honeybees are flying in a five mile radius, and so there's a billion plus honeybees overlapping as they're all looking for pollen. They don't just stick in their, in their acre. They're, they're out everywhere. Right. They're now saying that these diseases and pests and viruses are being passed in the flower. So a dirty bee from, you know, a mile away is leaving yeah. virus. Every, so if you, I think if you just left a honeybee alone and didn't have any other honeybees around it, I think it'd do really well. Yeah. It's an interesting, interesting thought. So yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. You know, I, I'm your honeybee listeners are getting mad at me. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So get them, get them onto the mason bees. Yeah, you know, just buy Try something else. Try something and, else. And I didn't say do with it. I said try a lot. You yeah. know, do other things. Let let your you know let a portion of your yard be um, uh, bare dirt so your ground nesters could move in. And so if you you've got a beautiful manicured lawn, whatever, leave your corners alone you know realize that lawns are green deserts mm -hmm. you know allow um, to the bee allow clover and dandelions to creep up or maybe take some of your lawn back you know yeah. you know maybe, maybe put a little native something like that in there that you don't have to water all the time less moldy right. yeah. yeah yeah that's what we're working on we uh, it's a 
an old, the, the guy that we got the, the house from, um, it was cow pasture all around and we're slowly letting it, it's, it's like reclaiming. It's just too much to mow and I don't feel like mowing it and Dude, I'd rather yeah. have trees and stuff around. It's, it's amazing how fast some of the, the, the plants and the trees will, will shoot up and grow and, you know, but. And less mowing and, and, and yes, you don't, in, in my backyard, we were on just a third of an acre and we, you know, a lot of space. I years ago was creating this pathway up the hillside and here's a bench in the next pathway. And I found myself over a period of years, you know, having always cut back those pathways and always have to pull the weeds out of those pathways. And so like, well, dude, no one's walking on these pathways. It's just me. The only reason, the only reason I'm here is to pull weeds. So, yeah. so I let it go and we never <laughs> go back there and those pathways are gone. And it was, it was a ritual of Dave wasting energy. There it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I get it. I, uh, yeah. Unless you're going to use it, you know? Unless you're going to use it, right? There we go. Oh, um, all right. So I, I don't want to keep you too long, but um, if people want to either learn more about bees or if they want to get some bees from you, where do they where do they go? Where do we find you? Uh, so Crown Bees, C R O W N Bees, B E E S, CrownBees dot com. Um, we teach for free. So if you look at our website, you're going to see a thing called Learn, and we tell you everything you want to know about the leaf cutter and the mason bees. So all right, so go learn. Uh, we have a thing called B-Mail. Just sign up. It's on the bottom of every webpage. Just put your name on there. And we're not selling this. I'd never do that. Um, we'll just tell you what to do. Okay. And then we have shop. We ha we care. We we have, I'm an engineer by degree. And so, oh my gosh, we have innovated and innovated because the more we learn about the bees, I'm trying to get the people successful. Okay. Yeah. You just, so go to our shop section. We have holes and houses and attractants and, you know, mud. And so we're just, you know, and we're just a, okay. It's just a company that cares about the planet, and and if we can get big enough, um, fast enough, can we find you know can we find more of the bees out there, and can we move past our North American turf into Australia and, and care about their? I hope. I hope. Yeah. You know, so good. there you go. So crownbees.com. Sign up for bee mail. Um, ask a question. We answer them. We care. All right. There you go, Ben. Oh. Thank you. I'll, I'll put that all in the, the show notes and uh, it'll be there for people to go, go check out and hopefully uh, you know, get some, get some more Mason bees out there. Yeah. Bees. Yeah, man. There you go. Hey, well, thanks. For